Genesis 22. The Bible tells us of the story when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Abraham, uh, Isaac. We all know the story of how Abraham waited a very long time to be able to have this, this same promised child. And then one morning, the Lord Almighty woke up and said, Okay, Abraham, I want this, your promised child, for you to sacrifice him unto, unto, him, unto me. And so in Genesis chapter 22, we want to, I, want you to, I want to call your attention to the demands of the Almighty God and the response of Abraham to that particular unusual demand. And the first thing I want you to notice, if you read that particular chapter of the Bible, the Bible makes us to understand that when the Almighty told Abraham and said, hey, I want you to sacrifice your son, this promised child, I want you to sacrifice him unto, him, unto me. You want you to notice in verse number, two, number three, the Bible says that Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and rose and went to the place which the Lord had told him. You will notice there that Abraham was not arguing. Okay? Abraham was not debating with the Almighty God. Abraham was not challenging the Almighty God and asking him, what's wrong with you? You know how long I waited for this boy. You know how long I've waited for this to see this boy become a part of my life. You know the kind of challenges I went through. But the Lord of the Bible tells us that as soon as he got that instruction, Abraham obeyed promptly. The second thing I want you to notice is that when Abraham released, when, he re, when he received this instruction, Abraham's willingness to release his son to the Almighty God, his willingness to let go of the child that he has waited for for a very long time. If you look at verse number nine, the Bible tells us, and they went and they came to the place which the Lord had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood on it. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. In other words, he already made up his mind. You are the one that gave me this boy. And I'm willing to release him back unto you. You are the one that gave me this boy. I'm willing to let him go and give him back unto you. So you see that Abraham was willing even to release the best thing that ever happened to his life. And the third and final thing I want you to notice in this particular chapter is that Abraham, you know, you will notice the divine response to the actions of Abraham. Okay. The divine response to the actions of Abraham. In verse number 16, the Bible tells us there, but that the Bible says, and say, my myself I have sworn. The Lord is not talking to Abraham. After Abraham have attempted, you know, have shown that he was willing to release Isaac. The Lord said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. And have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. And as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemy. In other words, Abraham, the fact that you released your son to me. The fact that you are not willing to hold back that which you waited 25 years for. The fact that you are willing to give this thing to me. The Bible tells us Abraham's release of his son provoked a divine response. Bible tells us that the Lord Almighty said, okay, because you did this to me, I am willing to open up the heavens unto you. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, if you read from verse number 13, the Bible says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no, no one greater, he swore by himself. He saw that what Abraham did was so unique. What Abraham did was so moving that the Bible said that there is nothing higher than the Almighty God in heaven. And the Lord swore by himself, saying, he says, surely, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply. In other words, you don't have an option. You are a blessed man. You don't have an option. Even if you don't want to be blessed, I am going to bless you. Even if you don't want the riches of heaven, I am going to release this unto you. Okay? The Bible makes us understand Abraham's willingness to release Isaac, his one and only promised child, on the altar of sacrifice, provoked a divine response that changed the story of Abraham forever. And today you can talk about the blessings of Abraham because of the sacrifice that Abraham was willing to offer. So you see, the demand for Isaac, I want you to understand it very carefully. The demand for Isaac was not because God was bloodthirsty. Okay? It wasn't because God wanted a barbecue made out of Isaac. 
That was not the reason why he wanted Isaac there, you know, wanted Isaac to, uh, Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. God's demand for Isaac was to determine where the heart of Abraham lied. That was the reason. So when God asks you for anything, it's not because God wants the thing. When he, asks for your, when he asks for your time or for your resources, it's not because he's going to change his status as, a, as God. No! It's to find out where your heart is. If God's demand for Isaac was not, to det- was not because God wanted a bond sacrifice. God doesn't support, no, does not support human sacrifice. That's not what he wants. He just wants to find out where is your heart, Abraham. God is trying to find out, does Abraham love the gift more than the giver of the gift? Does he love good? Does he love Isaac more than the God that gave him Isaac? Okay? God's demand for Isaac was to determine if Abraham loved the gift more than the giver. God's demand for Isaac for, for, for Isaac was to show where was the heart of Abraham. And by engaging the wisdom of sacrifice, by letting Isaac go, Abraham secured a future he could never have been able to attain by his own work. When you release what is in your hand. The Lord has a way of replenishing it. That's why the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 13, reading from verse number 22, it says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And that is by the sacrifice that that good man offers on the altar of sacrifice. Abraham was willing to offer something that was precious to him, to God. And by so doing, was able to secure not just his own future, But the future of that same boy that he put on the altar and the generations that was yet unborn. So sacrifice is not for the benefit of God. Please understand that. Sacrifice is not for the benefit of God. Sacrifice is for our own benefit because it gives us access to the throne of grace. And it releases the treasures of heaven into your life. That's what it does. Sacrifice is not for the benefit of God. It is for our own benefit because it gives us access to the treasures of heaven and secures our desired future. That's why, that's what sacrifice is all about. And as you all know, since the beginning of this month, we have been talking about the wisdom of daily exploits. Okay? We've been talking about the wisdom for daily exploits. That is the things, the wisdom that, you know, that is the application of the word of God in our daily lives. That's basically what that means. The wisdom of daily, wisdom for daily exploit is taking the word of God, the instructions of heaven, and then applying it into our lives. Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, if you read from verse 24, the Bible says that whosoever hears the saying of mine, in other words, whosoever see, hears the instruction of the Bible, whosoever turns the pages of scripture, read an instruction, read a command. He says, whosoever hears the saying of mine and does them, and put them into practice. Not just reading it. Not just admiring it. Not just putting it in a note. But when you read it, you do what it says. It says, whosoever hears the saying of mine and does them, I will liken him to be what? A wise man. Okay? Who builds his house upon the rock. That means you are building your life. You are building everything that pertains unto you on the foundation of the instructions of scripture. Say, so a man that does that, is a wise man. He said, because the rain will descend, the flood will come, the wind will blow, it will beat upon the house, and it will not fall, because it is founded on the one thing that can never change, the word of God. So when we, when we talk about the wisdom for daily exploits, we're talking about the application of that word of God, the engagement of that word of God, the practicing, putting to practice of that word of God, of that instructions of the word of God, in our daily lives. So when the Lord tells you do A and B, and you do A and B, you see the results. But when the Lord tells you, you know about it, but you don't do it, you don't see anything. Okay? The engagement of the instruction of the word of God in our life on a daily basis, that is what the wisdom for daily exploits is all about. So in our first installment, we talked about how we can access that particular wisdom. And we say the only way you can access the wisdom that will bless your life is to be able to read the word of God. We said access to the wisdom of God is needed when we immerse ourselves in the word of God. When you immerse yourself in the word of God. In our second installment, we talked about the wisdom for daily intercession. 
He said, one of the ways in which you can begin to see God move on your behalf is not just read the word of God, but to be able to immerse yourself in the word. It's not only to immerse yourself in the word of God, but to be able to present other people before the almighty God. So that what God, what you, what you make happen for other people, God does in your own life. I mean, if you are praying for other people, you think God is going to leave you alone? If you are blessing other people, you think God is going to leave you alone? If you are touching the life of other people with good things, you think God will allow bad things to come to you? It doesn't work like that. God is not a wicked God. Okay? God is not a wicked God. So we say, if you want to see exploits in your life, take attention away from yourself for just one second. Focus on another person. See what the Lord of my, bless that person in your prayer, bless that person in your action, and then will God will begin to move in your life. And we say, accessing the wisdom for day, you know, embedded in daily intercession requires us to pre present others before the Almighty God. Present others before the throne of grace. That's why when you are praying, not only bless me, bless me, bless me. It's good to pray, bless me, bless me. But pray, bless my brother also. Okay? Pray, bless my sister also. Every now and then you can remember the pastor. You know, it is good, but it's good. No, but the whole idea is that if you want to see God move on your behalf, pray for others. Because what you make happen for other people, God will make happen for you. It's a very simple thing. Okay? And then in our third installment, which we did in our last meeting together, we talked about the wisdom of daily testimonies. Okay? The wisdom of daily testimony. And we say the wisdom of daily testimony requires that you remember the things that God has done in your life. Because when you forget the things that God has done in your life, you invite depression. You invite despondency. You begin to quench the fire of hope. You begin to quench the fire of faith. When you say that, when you don't remember anything that God has done for you, when everything you see is the disappointment that is in, the, that is in life, you will find out that you live a very, very gloomy life. But when you remember what God has done, what it does is that it has a way of firing up your faith. Because you'll be able to say, if God has done this in the past, he can do it today. If he can do it for my sister, he can do it for me. If he can do it for my brother, he can do it for me. Even when I'm weak, if the Lord can lift me up, he can lift me up right now, even when I'm strong. So when you remember, the testimonies of the Almighty God, it has a way of moving you to a place of victory. And so, wisdom of daily testimony requires you to recount, requires you to remember, requires you to continue to testify about the goodness of the Almighty God in your life on a daily basis. And by the way, all these things that we've talked about, if you've missed any of them, you can always go pick it up on our Facebook, on our YouTube page. They are there sitting down waiting for you to just take a look at it. So this morning, in our final installment in this series, I'll be sharing with you the wisdom of daily sacrifice. The wisdom of daily sacrifice. In Psalm 50, Psalm 50, reading from verse number 5, the Bible tells us, it says, Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. He said, Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is George Selah. What does that mean? What the Bible is simply telling us that it said, the Lord of Almighty said, gather my people down to me. Those who have made a covenant, those who have made an agreement, those who have made a testament with me by sacrifice. In verse number six, he said, then when those people have been gathered together, when those people who have made a covenant with me have been brought together, he said, the Bible is now saying, the heavens will now declare the righteousness of God upon their life. What does that mean? God himself will make sure that the sacrifice of those people who have been, that have been placed upon the altar for his name. He said, God himself will make sure that those sacrifices that have been consecrated to him will produce the desired results. So God himself will make sure that whatever you paid the price to give to him and the reason for which you brought that particular offering God is saying, I will make sure that that reason is fulfilled in your life. He said, gather unto me this, my saints, gather my saints together to me. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Say, let the heavens declare his righteousness. For God himself will be judge of it. In other words, God himself will make up his mind. God himself will make sure that those sacrifices produce the results that they are supposed to have. And that is what the psalmist is saying in that verse of the scripture. The psalmist is saying, God has committed his integrity to making sure that the altar of sacrifice that you and I rear for him produce the result that we're looking for. 
In other words, God is not going to make sure that your sacrifice is not wasted. The time you spend in his presence is not wasted. The resources you produce, you produce, you provide to him is not wasted. The energy that you put into the service of the kingdom is not wasted. He said, God himself will make sure that your sacrifice is not wasted. He will make sure that your sacrifice deliver its results. And the question is, why will God do that? Hmm? Why will God commit his integrity to making sure that the sacrifice you give to him produce results? Why will God do that? Why will God regard and respect the sacrifice of his people? Go back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. I want us to start reading from verse number 15. The Bible said, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. And I have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply the descendant as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemy. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Here the Bible is telling us that God regards, God respects, God gives an assurance. God commits his integrity to our sacrifice because your sacrifice tells the almighty God that you believe in him and you trust in him. When you take what is precious to you and you lay it upon the altar, what you are basically telling the almighty God is that I trust you and I have faith in you. That's what you're saying. And the Bible makes us to understand that without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. And whosoever comes to him must believe that he, is a, he, that he is and is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when the Lord sees that you present something precious, something that is very valuable to you, something that is precious to you, if you see that you put it on the altar for him, you consecrate it to him, you devote it to him, what happened? God knows that you trust him and God responds. Number two. Why does God regard your sacrifice? The Lord regards our sacrifice because our sacrifice demonstrates that we recognize him as the only source of all good things. And as he's the sustainer of all good things. Bible makes us to understand that Abraham knew that his son only came from God. The Bible said that his body was dead and that of Sarah was also dead. Yet, a son came out of both of them. And the Bible makes us to understand. If you begin, if you look at it, I think in the book of, uh, in the book of Hebrews, that same Hebrews chapter 11, it said that he, God, Abraham figured that God was able to wake up his own son. He said, well, you gave it to me when I'm dead. I know if I give him back to you, wake him up again. So what's the problem? You take That was what was going on at the back of his mind. So God regards our sacrifice because it tells God that he is the source of all things. Number three, God regards our sacrifice because it demonstrates that we are surrendered and we are yielded unto him. It tells him that, yes, I mean, you are the owner of all things. You control all things. What is the essence of me trying to hide from you? What is the essence of me trying to hoard what you gave me? I surrender it unto you. So he tells the Almighty God, when you present an offering, when you present a sacrifice to the Almighty God, you are telling him that I'm totally surrendered unto you. I'm totally yielded unto you. There's nothing too much for me to take away from your table. I'm totally given unto you. The Bible said, because you have done this, you know, because you have given that precious thing, because you have not withholding your son from me, because you have not taken, you have not considered your son to be too important for me not to be able to release, I will bless you. Forget about blessing. You go get blessing. You go tire. You will be blessed to the point that you say, I don't want it anymore, and I will still keep blessing you. That is the point the Lord Almighty is saying. The, these are some of the reasons why the Almighty God commits his integrity to making sure that our altar of sacrifice produces the result. Now you have heard. Me talk about this thing, sacrifice, sacrifice. The question is, what is this thing called sacrifice? What is it? What is sacrifice and how does it operate? Sacrifice is when you give up something that is precious to you in order to secure what you desire. When you give up something that is important. When you give up something that you consider precious. When you release it in the service of the Almighty God. That is what sacrifice is all about. Number two, sacrifice is when you release the right of ownership. The right of ownership to something valuable as an act of worship to the Almighty God. I release my time. I say, Lord, use it for your own glory. 
I release my talent. I say, Lord, use it for your glory. I release my resource. I say, Father, use it for your own glory. That is what it means to sacrifice to the Almighty God. The release of the right of ownership to something valuable as an act of worship. Sacrifice is offering something that is very, very costly to the Almighty God. Because if you begin to value your time, value your talent, value your resources, they are costly. These are things that you may not be able to get back. But when you present it to the altar of the Almighty God as a means of worship, God considers that to be a sacrifice. And that's why the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel, if you read from verse 24, 2 Samuel 24, 24, the Bible says that David was about to offer sacrifice. But the man that, wanted to, that, that owned the field that David wanted to, you wanted to give it to David for free. And David said, no way. If I want to serve God, I cannot give him something that does not cost me anything. So David said, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer a burnt offering to the Lord my God or that, or with that which cost me nothing. If it is not precious, if it doesn't cost you anything, it is not a sacrifice. Okay? Because you can easily give it away. But if it is something that you think very, you think twice before you put your hands into the pocket. And as we are bringing it, there's something telling you, oh boy, you think you are right? This African man is telling you all this story and you won't still want to give this thing. And you keep arguing. You are debating. You are challenging. You put it there. You sit down. You stand up. You sit down. You stand up. You are at home. You are sleeping. That is what it means by sacrifice. Because you are wrestling inside of you to release that thing. But if it's something you give without thinking, it really doesn't talk, it really doesn't hurt you. So David is saying, I am not going to offer anything to God that does not pinch my system. I'm not going to offer anything to God that does not cost me anything. You think it's easy to, for people to come to church every morning? There are a million and one things that people are doing that are supposed to be doing. Even if you have nothing to do, you can sit and watch and binge uh, Netflix. But people come to church. That is a sacrifice on its own. So please understand. David said, I will not offer a bond suffering to the Lord of that which cost me nothing. So sacrifice is the offering of something that is costly, something that is valuable in the worship of the Almighty God. Now, when we talk about the wisdom of daily sacrifice, we are talking about the daily surrendering of the things that we consider to be important, something that we consider to be precious in the worship of the Almighty God. So every day when you wake up in the morning, your time is precious. But you say, Lord, I give it to you. Your resources are precious. You say, Lord, I give it unto you. My service is precious. I give it unto you. The things that are important, I lay it upon the altar. That is what it means when you are talking about wisdom of daily sacrifice. The wisdom of daily sacrifice is the daily release of our precious time, of our precious talent, of our precious treasures as an act of worship before the Almighty God. And the question is, how does the act of daily sacrifice work? How does it work? How does it work? The, the act of daily sacrifice works, number one, through the process of deliberate and conscious decision. In other words, you cannot offer anything to God without you being very deliberate and being very conscious. If it's something that you do as an afterthought, it doesn't have any impact on your life. But this is something you think about. This is something that you are sure you want to release. You know exactly the cost of what you are putting on the table. And you say, Lord, here you have it. Okay? Please understand. When God said Abraham, and Abraham said, yes, Lord, I'm here. We're going to be jamming today at Mount Moriah. Say, yeah, okay, yeah. But when you're coming for the party, I need, your, I need you to bring your boy. Oh, which one are you talking about? Isaac. Yeah, Isaac. The one I waited 25 years for. I say, yeah, bring him. And when you get there, uh, we're going to be making some barbecue and Isaac will be the one that we're using. I say, Abraham, say, okay, no problem, no problem, no problem. We'll be there. I'll see you in three days. And Abraham started walking and got there. Abraham knew exactly what God was asking. He knew exactly. There was no mistake about it. He knew that God wanted Isaac. So when you are talking about the practice of daily sacrifice, it is something that you are conscious of. It's something that is deliberate. You know it. It's a conscious decision. Okay? Number two, the practice of daily sacrifice before the Almighty God is a willing surrender. You willingly give it. You are not cajoled. You are not deceived. And that's why you will notice here that we never make an offer and begin to tell you, there's somebody here. God says you do this, begin to cajole. If I cajole you today, somebody else will cajole you tomorrow. If it is not from your heart, it is not accepted. It has to be a willing sacrifice. 
something that you give. If it is not from your heart, you have succeeded in throwing that thing away. As much as we need the money, I remember getting myself in trouble some years ago. When somebody went when the meeting and somebody was talking about that, uh, we should give, we should give. I said, well, if you are not born again, if you give, you have just wasted your money. The guy was so angry when I said that. But that is the truth. The Bible makes us to understand that you first of all have to give yourself before you present anything to the Almighty God. There has to be a willing surrender of whatever you are bringing to the presence of the Almighty God. Abraham was not cajoled. God did not have any conversation. He gave the instruction, step back and watch Abraham act. So for you to practice the act, the, 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 the wisdom of daily sacrifice, number one, it has to be a conscious decision. Number two, it has to be a willing surrender. Number three, it has to be a deliberate action. A deliberate action. You give it deliberately. Even when it is painful, you are giving it. Even when you don't like it, you are giving it. Even when that thing is, ah, oh boy, don't you remember that thing that you're supposed to pay? Don't you see the bill? All of a sudden, the devil starts reminding you of a million things you are supposed to do with that money. But you deliberately release it. It's a deliberate action. The Bible tells us in, in that particular, in Genesis 22, if you read verse number 10, it says, Abraham stretched out his hand to take with her and took the knife to slay his son. It was a deliberate action. He knew that that boy was going to die. But the Bible makes us to understand that he was willing to do it. It was a deliberate action. That is what that... And finally, daily sacrifice goes through the process of committed determination. A committed determination. The reason it goes to committed determination is because of is this. Can you imagine? Just play the scene. Abraham was sitting, you know, stretched out uh, Isaac on, the, on that altar. And as he stretched out Isaac on that altar, he looked at the face of Isaac. Isaac, he said, oh boy, which one did they do? Eh? It's me, oh, you know. And Isaac said, yeah, I know it's you. And you still want to do this in here? Oh, but why now? You did this, what did you eat last night? Or three days ago that you're still messing with your head? I'm sure there's a lot of conversation going on in their head. But I, the Bible tells us that Abraham was still made, was still, was still determined to keep that sacrifice upon that altar. Okay. So for you, for the way the daily sacrifice works is to be committed, is a committed determination. A commitment not to withdraw the sacrifice from the altar, no matter how difficult it feels. I remember making a pledge. Sometimes I went to a, I went to a program and I wrote a check. And they told us there that that check was, we can post date the check. Okay? We can write a whole check and then post date it. But for some reason, the people who were processing the check for that ministry decided to put the check as soon as they got, you know, as soon as we got home. That messed up all my accounts for the month. Even for a number of months, it messed me up because they just kept on putting the checks. All I could have done was just call the bank and say, okay, cancel all these things, stop all these payments. But the idea, what I'm trying to make you to understand is that for you to be able, for daily sacrifice to be able to benefit you, you have to keep that commitment to keep the act sacrifice upon the altar, even when it is painful. Okay? Abraham refused to let Isaac go, not because he did not love Isaac, not because he did not feel the pain of Isaac, not because he did not understand that Isaac was confused and Isaac was wondering if his father had gone mad, but he kept that sacrifice upon the altar because he knew that every, every, you know, the, the, the sacrifice changes everything. And in Hebrews 11 verse 8, verse 18, the Bible tells us, Abraham calculated, Abraham figured out, Abraham came to the conclusion that God was able to raise him up from the dead. Because, I mean, he got him at an old age. So the point we're making here is this. For sacrifice to work, number one, it has to be a conscious decision. Number two, it has to be a willing, there has to be a willing surrender. Number three, there has to be a deliberate action. And then number four, there has to be a committed determination to keep that sacrifice upon the altar. Even when it is not convenient. Okay? So you see, Abraham was not crazy. He understood it. And he understood that the sacrifice that works is the sacrifice that is willing. A sacrifice that is, you know, that is without pressure. A sacrifice that is kept upon the altar even when it is difficult. And the question is that, how did Abraham come to that conclusion? Abraham come, came to the conclusion because Abraham understood that sacrifices are very, very powerful. And why are sacrifices powerful? Sacrifices are powerful because they attract the attention of the Almighty God. Many of you have heard the story of Job. 
The Bible says that Job will sacrifice for his sons and his daughter. He was a righteous man. He was good at doing all the sacrifices that God himself noticed in heaven. And God, like a very proud parent, called Satan and said, Satan, you see my boy, Job, the guy is so good. You know, when God begins to, be, you know, begins to brag about you, you expect that the devil himself is going to get pissed. And the devil got pissed, you know, and started dealing with you. But the point I'm making is that sacrifice is powerful because it attracts the attention of the Almighty God. Sacrifice is powerful because it opens the windows of heaven. Okay? It opens the windows of heaven. The Bible says that you should bring the tithe to the storehouse. How can a man wake up in the morning, write a 10% of his income, that he work very, very hard, and give it to a church? And people will say, what is wrong with you, these people? You have, you have, you have received your religion with foolishness. But the Lord Almighty said, bring the tithe into my house say, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you. So traffic Christ... Sacrifice is powerful because it opens the windows of heaven. Number three, sacrifice is powerful because it challenges the integrity of the Almighty God. It challenges the integrity of the Almighty God. God says, I will open the windows of heaven. And now you say, okay, God, you said you are going to open the windows of heaven, right? Okay, here is it. Oh yeah, where the window of heaven where you want open? If the window of heaven is not now open, you ask say, God, you see, ah, I think you are a little bit short on your words now. You can go back to the Almighty God and challenge Him. But the Lord is saying that, prove me herewith, said the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven when you do what I ask you to do. So sacrifice challenges the authority and the integrity of the Almighty God. And then finally, sacrifice commit God into action. It forces Him to do what He said He wants to do. If you already told you he's going to do X, Y, and Z, if you do this, and when you do it, you can go back and say, Lord, I have done what you asked me to do. What, why is there no action? So sacrifice commits God to action. Okay? So the question that I have in mind that if sacrifice attracts, you know, God's attention, if it opens the windows of heaven, if sacrifice is so powerful and is able to turn the hand of heaven, the question is why are a lot of people in the church not involved in sacrifices? Why don't they offer sacrifice to the Almighty God? The very first reason why people don't offer sacrifice is my brother's sacrifice is very difficult. Extremely painful and difficult. It is not easy for you to write a check and put it down. I can tell you that. It is not easy for you to wake up at 6 a.m. and pray. I can tell you. It is not easy for you to do the service of the kingdom. It looks good. It looks easy if you are watching from the outside. But if you are the one doing it, it is not easy. So a lot of people are not, are not involved in sacrifice because it is difficult. A lot of people are not involved in sacrifice because it is painful. Sacrifice is painful. When you take something precious and you lay it down as you are going, huh? Shame you, I have, not, have I not made a mistake like this? Eh? I don't even know what they are using the money for. Eh? See, the guy is looking good. And I mean, all sorts of things, <laughs> all sorts of things are running in your head. <laughs> you want to turn back and say, ah, all this pastor, don't want everybody wants to open a church. Eh? <laughs> the Lord will help us in Jesus. But the point is <laughs> that a lot of people don't do this thing because it's difficult. It is painful. And not only that, it is costly. Sacrifice is a very costly business. It's a very, very costly business. The Bible says Jesus Christ, when he was about to offer the ultimate sacrifice for sin, he prayed in Matthew 26. In verse number 39, Jesus, the Bible says he went a little further, fell on his face and prayed. He said, oh my father, this is God incarnate. God in the flesh. He said, oh my father, if it is possible, let's make a deal. Eh? Take this thing away. Eh? Let one other angel come and die and do this thing. <laughs> because it's not easy. But the Bible says, that if, it is, if it is possible, let this cup pass over me. But because he was willing to pay the price, he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but let your will be done. It tells you sacrifice is not cheap. Sacrifice is extremely costly. But those who pay the price of sacrifice, those who are willing to endure the pain of sacrifice those who are willing to go through all the challenges that sacrifice pose in the life of an individual those kind of people they have benefits associated with it when you pay the price of sacrifice there is always blessings associated and what are those benefits what are the benefits of sacrifice number one benefit you find is that sacrifice has the ability to break the curses in the life of an individual 
When you are operating a course or you think there is a pattern of a course in your life and you want it broken, if you offer a sacrifice to the Almighty God, those courses are broken. And we see it in, Gen in Genesis chapter 8. The Bible says that when there was a curse upon the whole world, well, after Noah emerged out of the ark, in verse number 21, it said, The Lord smelled a smooth, a soothing aroma that the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. After, I, after, uh, after Noah, and offered a sacrifice to the Almighty God. So sacrifice. The blessings of sacrifice is the blessing of a broken cause. The blessings of a broken yoke in our life. Number two. The blessing of a sacrifice is the blessing of a covenant that is assured by the Almighty God. The Bible says, I have sworn by myself. That means I'm giving you an assurance. That regardless of what you are going through. I am going to bless you if you put that sacrifice upon that altar. So the blessing of sacrifice, number one, is the blessing of broken causes. Number two, is the blessing of covenant blessing. Number three, is the blessing of defense and protection. Bible tells us, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the Lord God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offering and accept your bond sacrifices. So you find if you read the entire, if you read that entire psalm, you see that the, 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 the blessings of defense, the blessings of protection accrue to those who present a sacrifice to the Almighty God. Not only that, there is also the blessing of fruitfulness. Bible tells us that when, uh, when Sarah, after he made an offering of, you know, entertaining people he did not know. The Bible tells us in verse number 10 of Genesis 18. He said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. That is a result of when you present an offering or a sacrifice before the Almighty God. And then finally is the blessing of supernatural, you know, is the blessing of supernatural blessings. That looks like, but anyway, blessings of supernatural blessings. The idea is that when King Solomon, the young king, after he had been crowned the king of Israel, the Bible said that he went to Jerusalem and made a lavish offering to the Almighty God. An offering that they have never seen before. Thousands of rams, thousands of sheep, thousands, I mean, all the people blew. And the Bible said that very night, the Lord said and came to him. He said, because... I say, I have given to you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be none, anyone like you among the kings in all your days. That is the result of offering a sacrifice to the Almighty God. Supernatural blessing. And if you want to know how rich Solomon is, you go and read chapter 4, 1 Kings chapter 4. And there you will see how rich this guy was. Where you are actually kicking gold in the street of Jerusalem. That's how rich the guy was. Okay? So, these are just some of the many blessings that come when you offer sacrifices to the Almighty God. That is what accrues. The question then is, how do you engage with the wisdom of daily sacrifice in your life? How do you engage it? Or who is the person, sorry, who engages in this particular thing? Who is the person that engages in the wisdom of daily sacrifice? Number one, the person who can do this thing is the person who makes up his mind on a daily basis to present himself to the Almighty God. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 tells us, I beseech you, dear brethren, by the mercies of the Lord, that you present your bodies to the Almighty God as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. There has to be a presentation of yourself. When Paul the Apostle was talking about the church in Macedonia, he said before they presented any offering, before they sent any gift to any church, he said they presented themselves first to the Almighty God. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. They presented themselves to the Almighty God first. So there has to be a daily presentation of yourself to the Almighty God. That's why we ask you to pray in the morning. That's why we do the morning devotional. You say, Lord, I present myself to you. Number two, who is going to be the man or the woman who will engage in the daily sacrifice, engage the wisdom of daily sacrifice, is a man that is ready to surrender himself on a daily basis to the Almighty God. You surrender yourself to him. You say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. You release yourself into his care and say, Lord, have your way. Not by my power, but yours, O God. Not by my will, but yours, be, your will be done. It's a daily surrender of yourself. Number three, it must be a daily consecration. A daily consecration to the Almighty God. Somebody who is willing to dedicate himself, devote himself to the Almighty God. That doesn't mean you are not going to walk. Oh. That's not what it means. But it means that you see your walk as an act of worship. 
is see your conversation as an act of worship. You see everything you do as an act of worship. You know, it's the church. We have a way of messing with people. We created what is called the circular sacred splits, where individuals become pious at church, and they become the devil when they get out of the church. It's like they have a switch. On Sunday, we switch on the religious part of us. Everybody's looking nice, looking perfect. But by the time we get out of here by 12 or 12.30, we switch back on the regular cell. And then we start. And that is not the intention of the Almighty God. Our life is supposed to continually be a representation of the Almighty God. So there has, there's not supposed to be what is called the circular sacred split. There shouldn't be that one. Your life should be the same all through. And that is what is meant by daily consecration. That every day, everywhere you are, you are a representation of Christ. You are an example of a believer. And then finally, number four, the man or the woman who will engage the wisdom of daily sacrifice is that man that is ready to be involved in the service of the Almighty God on a daily basis. Now, the service of the Almighty God does not necessarily mean preaching on the pulpit. It simply means being the hand and the feet of the Almighty God everywhere you go. Being able to tell somebody about the word of God. Being able to extend the love of God to other people. Being able to touch the life of somebody that you meet that you don't even know. That's what it means to be involved in the service of the Almighty God. If you read the book of James, you say, Let's say that person must do the work of God. And they say, what is the work of God? Say, remember the widows, remember the orphans, remember the fatherless, remember the people who are less free. Do, the, you know, extend the grace of God to other people. That's basically what it means. And anybody who wants to be engaged in the, uh, in the wisdom of daily sacrifice must be ready to do what? To, be in, to, to, to involve themselves in daily service of the master. Okay? Like I said earlier, sacrifice is not a joke. Okay? Whatever I'm telling you right now, it's easy to talk about it. It's very difficult to practice. Okay? It is not easy to do. It is very difficult. Engaging the wisdom of daily sacrifice requires a different mindset. It requires a different way of thinking. It requires a different way of looking at life. And that mindset is the mindset of Christ. So we're going to close with a verse of the scripture. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse number 5. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondsman and coming in the likeness of a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the, of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of, the, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those on, under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My brothers and sisters, daily sacrifice it's not something easy. Daily presentation of yourself to the Almighty God is not easy. It requires the mind of Christ. It requires the attitude of Christ. It requires a changing of your outlook in life. A different worldview. And the question this morning is that, do you have that mindset? Do you have that particular attitude? Do you have a mindset that is willing to engage the wisdom that is embedded in daily sacrifice. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.